Good morning. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, turn our eyes to you in all that we think and all that we do. Let us fix our gaze upon Jesus. Help us to understand, not only with our, with our mind and the words that it, that it forms, but with our spirits, all the true action and meaning of how we argue and what we argue about. Father in heaven, you've given us so much in Jesus Christ. Before we begin today, give us a time when we can truly praise you, when we can sing to you. Our Father in heaven, bless this time now. Make our praises sincere. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and sing to the Lord. The, the importance of what we uh, do today arises from our, our need to, to set our eyes on Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus at one point says, uh, when he's describing the, the angels, that although they're, they're ministering, they're serving, they're aiding and assisting uh, the, the saints, those who are, are destined to be with, with God, that they keep their eyes on God at all times. That al- although they're, they're uh, sent and helping others, uh, their eyes are on the face of God at all time. That's Matthew 18.10. And uh, we know we need to be like that too. In, in Hebrews, we read about this. Uh, we have, have learned in Jesus Christ that we can see the face of God ourselves at all times. We can fix our eyes on Jesus and only in that way know God. And we have to do that all the time. Our eyes have to be uh, fixed there. And uh, last week, I hope you took the, the major lesson. I say last week, I mean in our last uh, class. Uh, one way in which our trials on earth are expressed by Satan, one way in which Satan tempts, is with argument. And al- although a temptation can't be fully explained in terms of logical arguments, that is one way it manifests itself to us. And overcoming temptation, we read, as Christ did it uh, when he was in the wilderness, it's partially expressed in what we're doing with our mind. That is to say, Satan uses various tricks to turn our mind to the wrong thing. There's the the tree of of life in the the garden, and the mind of Eve is turned aside to the tree of the knowledge of of good and evil. We talked somewhat about the, the logical methods that we face in arguments and Eve faced, and saw the same thing in Jesus Christ. And of course, the temptation of, of Satan is different, uh, not different, more full, in that there was also hunger, uh, there was also need, there was also ambition, there was also vainglory. There, there are many other things going on in the temptation, but part of the way it manifests itself is in argumentation, and part of the way that that trial is, is dealt with, resolved, and we conquer through it, is with proper argumentation. And Jesus shows us how that's done. And again, I would sum it up for you. I would say, whatever you're ministering to as a lawyer, whoever you're helping, you must keep your eyes on the face of God as the face of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes on him. This is the safe uh, course. So uh, what I'm talking about to you today is I, I, I think all of us understand this from our experience of argumentation. Frequently, we, we set out with good intentions when we argue, and then we find ourselves doing something very empty. We're focused on words. We've lost track of the, the realities that we care about. We've stopped ministering and serving God and serving the people that we're trying to correct or educate. And instead, we find ourselves lost in temptation and, and trial. Today we want to continue to to think about how Jesus argued. We want to fix our eyes on him and learn from him. How do you you keep the right focus? How do you ground an an argument and conduct an argument so that you're not led astray by those who are trying to to tempt you, by those who are, are trying you? And this is immediately applicable to your lives. You will be arguing for the rest of your lives as as lawyers. And you must recognize the spiritual dimension of what argument has in it, the capacity to pull your eyes away from God 
and to pull it into the traps, uh, the traps and the temptations of Satan. Uh, today we, we take as our uh, story of, of argumentation uh, the passages in Mark 10, and I think there are some dimensions in the parallel passage in Matthew 19. And when I give you these, uh, these uh, handouts, print them out, because it's actually easier to follow along with what I'm, what I'm doing uh, if you have this printed out and you can take your notes on that, and I think you'll actually uh, follow along better. As I've summarized in the left-hand column of, of the printout uh, for you, uh, the basic structure of argumentation here, the trial, so to speak, the Pharisees, were told, are coming and they're trying Christ. That is to say, they're, they're not arguing in good faith. They're trying to lead Jesus astray. They're trying to get him to say something or do something or be uh, diverted from keeping his eyes on the Father. And uh, the basic structure, just as we saw with, with Satan in the garden and in, in the wilderness, is uh, involved in, in seeming to do one thing and actually doing another. There's a technical uh, term for this problem that I'm going to describe for you, you now. In uh, the theory of rhetoric, it's called stasis theory, which is uh, familiar to you when you're writing your, your case briefs and you've wrestled with the difficulty of figuring out what the issue in a case is really. There are some arguments going this way, some arguments going this way, and we have to figure out what is the, the issue that is at, at stake in the argument. What exactly really is the, the point at which the argument comes to a head? And one way that people can mislead you in argumentation is by saying the issue is one thing, but then trying to win the argument by making arguments that are a little unrelated to that issue. They secretly change the issue and they win over the decision maker or they confuse you because they offer arguments which seem valid and true but aren't really true about the issue that is claimed uh, to be the center of the debate. So we, we see uh, today the Pharisees open up to, to Christ, and uh, they offer the following issue in, in Mark 10. Is it lawful for a, a man to divorce his wife or send his wife away? Is that uh, lawful? And uh, this is a, a complex uh, issue full of equivocation. That is to say, full of words which can mean more than one thing. Uh, the central equivocation of the issue that they offer, and it's not the issue that they're going to pursue, but the issue they initially offer, is what does it mean for something to be lawful? Uh, the, the, the Greek word does not involve the root of, of law. It's a different, uh, different idea. It means more like, is it, is it allowed? Is it, is it decent? Is it respectable uh, to do this? Uh, but you can see two different sense of this idea of being free to do something or lawful. One would mean, is it authorized? Has, has the ruler said, this is a good thing to do? So, for example, it is lawful to keep your contracts. You have a, a lawful duty to keep your contracts. There is a duty. The law has imposed a duty to keep your contracts, and it is emphatically lawful to keep your duty. Indeed, it is a fulfillment of a requirement. Is it lawful to pay your taxes? Indeed, it is lawful to pay your taxes. The opposite of paying your taxes is a crime. Everyone see that, that idea? And then there's an, another thing in which we could say something is, is lawful. We could ask, is it lawful to break your contracts? Well, it's not a crime. You won't go to jail for doing it. You'll be assessed damages for doing it, perhaps. Uh, but we, we also have emphatically said it is not a tort to breach a, a contract, and it is not a crime to breach a contract. So is it lawful to breach a contract? It is lawful in the sense that it is not prohibited. It is lawful in the sense that there is no penalty in criminal law for doing so. So... What do we mean when we say lawful? Not much yet. You have to define. What do you mean? Do you mean 
Is it required? Is it prohibited? Is it not punished? Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? And that's very undefined by the question that the Pharisees ask. And so you could go a lot of different ways uh, with that, that question. Another uh, question which is kind of pulled out from Matthew 19.3 is, when you say, is it lawful to divorce your wife, uh, are you saying for any reason whatsoever? And uh, I think we can understand uh, Mark 10.2 a little better by looking at Matthew uh, 19, because we get a little longer version of the Pharisees' argument. And the longer version of the Pharisees' argument there is, is it lawful to divorce your wife for any reason? Can you send away your wife for any reason, every reason, whatsoever? And you can see the equivocation uh, there as well in what's said in, in Mark 10. When you ask, is it lawful to divorce your wife, what do you mean? Do you mean for any reason? When you say a reason, do you mean a good reason? Or do you mean to include bad reasons? What do you, what do you mean by, by that? But we see as the argument progresses, and I'm going to skip over Jesus' response right now. We see as the argument uh, uh, progresses, the Pharisees are actually thinking about a, a different argument, a different issue. Because when they are pressed to give a justification for, for asking this question, they point to a very specific passage. And that passage is set out for you in the far right uh, column. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Uh, the Pharisees say, uh, as their, their follow-up statement of the issue, uh, Moses has commanded us to uh, write a certificate of divorce when you put your wife away, and that shows what we mean by saying you can divorce for any and every reason. Now, that's a little hard to understand. And when the text is hard to understand like this, when it's talking about a, a scripture, you should go look up the scripture. If an argument is about a statute, you should look at the statute. If the argument is about the Constitution, you should look at the Constitution. You, you have to look at the, the, the thing which is being referred to to understand the argument. So the, the only passage in the scripture in which there is any suggestion at all of a command or a permission uh, to people to write a, a bill of divorce, which we'll talk about in a second, is in Deuteronomy chapter 24. And so let's consider what the Pharisees are really arguing by looking at the, uh, the law of God that they, they cite. They're focusing here on the very uh, first sentence of Deuteronomy 24 which reads, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce or a bill of divorce and he gives it to her and sends her from his house. And their, uh, their interpretation of this is that Moses implicitly commands that if you divorce your wife, you give her a certificate of divorce. Now, why would that command lead you to think you could divorce your wife for any reason? It, it sounds like it has nothing to do with the reasons for which you divorce your wife. The command, supposedly, although in the Hebrew, you'll see this is a very complicated and, and, and controversial reading of this uh, passage. Uh, all it says so far is, if you divorce your wife, you have to give her a certificate of divorce. It has nothing to do with whether you can divorce your wife, when you can divorce your wife, under what conditions you can divorce your wife. It creates a relationship between divorce and giving a certificate of divorce. Uh, the, uh, the Jews at the time were divided into two schools, they say the school of Hillel and the school of, of Shammai, and they had different readings of this passage. And the, the school of Hillel said, look, if the passage had said, 
If a man marries a woman who has done something indecent, then it would mean that you could only divorce in the case of indecency, adultery, uh, some kind of sexual indecency, some kind of serious wrong relating to the, the, the status of the marriage. But the school of, of, of Hillel said it doesn't say that. It says uh, because he finds something indecent. And so they reasoned and said, uh, God doesn't use redundant words. If all it takes is him to find something indecent, not there to be something indecent. Do you, do you see the argument? Uh, they were also concerned about some other issues. They said, well, look, if a man gives a, a bill of divorce and a woman goes out and uh, remarries, and then later uh, the man says she didn't do anything indecent, then the bill of divorce would be defective and the second man would be guilty of adultery. The second marriage would be uh, bigamous at, at best. Uh, and so we can't have the effectiveness of the bill of divorce dependent on an actual finding of wrong. This is a very interesting kind of argument. You can see the legal reasoning that's going on. If bills of divorce are to be effective public documents, then the, the ground which is stated, I find something indecent in this woman, has to be conclusive. The, the school of Shammai, by, by contrast, said your, your, your reading is wrong. It says because he finds. Because he finds means he actually finds. It doesn't mean he can make it up. It doesn't mean he can rely on a non-indecent thing. You're, you're trivializing the word of God, and your idea of the effectiveness of this might be accurate, but that's not what, what uh, God is, is saying here. And the school of, of Hillel and, Sh and Shammai argued this solely focusing on these words. They, they cut this debate out, and they made this a, a verbal argument. What, what are these words saying? And uh, to be honest, friends, I think this is a very good example for us, both of something that we find often lawyers doing, uh, turning what should be a debate about justice and mercy and right, the political goods of a society for which we compose our laws, the problems that we're facing, what justice and equity require, we turn it into just a, a game about the meaning of words. And the meaning of words uh, is determined by things. It's not determined by dictionaries. Dictionaries are just tools for understanding intent and, and usage. But the true servant of God has his, face, his eyes on the face of God at all times. And he is always understanding that law comes down to us not as a, an artifact, something invented by man, but to accomplish God's purposes in the world. Uh, and they've lost track of that, I, I would say here. It's a very interesting legal set of arguments. Uh, it, it's it's a, an interesting puzzle. Uh, but... Uh, Notice what they're doing here in their, in their reasoning is they've shifted from the argument issue. Can I divorce my wife or can I divorce her for any reason to the issue? Does the fact that a bill of divorcement can be given for any reason define the conditions under which I can divorce? See, see the two issues. First issue that's presented is, hey, can you divorce your wife? Under what circumstances can you divorce your wife? But the, the whole substance of their argument rests on a very different issue, which is can we determine from the circumstances where you can issue a bill of divorcement that is effective to the circumstances when you can divorce? The bill of divorcement and divorce are two separate things. The, the word divorce uh, means sending away. The, the, the Greek word and, and the Hebrew word, they're, they're not uh, legal terms predominantly. Today we think of divorce as a particular kind of, of legal act. But the, the Greek term and the Hebrew term are rest on, on a physical act, a, a substantial act, a, an act in the real world. Can you send your wife away? Can you push her out the door? Can you, can you stop marital relations? Can you stop supporting her? Can you push her away? 
That's what's, what's, what's being discussed. The Jews here say, we read Deuteronomy 24 to say, if you push away your wife, if you stop supporting her, then you have to do something. And that is, the man who pushes the woman away has to give her, put into her hands, a bill, that is to say, a public document, something which can be passed from party to party. And it, the bill is a, a bill of divorcement, and the word here is separate in Greek and in Hebrew. Uh, the word in Greek is, is the word apostasion, which is where we get our word apostasy, which means cutting off. You are apostate if you cut yourself off from God. If you're once with God and you cut yourself off from God, that's an act of apostasy. And the bill of apostasy is the man saying to the world and delivering the means of proving this, I make no claim on this woman. She is free to be taken by any other man. And why would she want this? Well, without this, the first husband could accuse anyone else who slept with her of adultery. And the penalty of adultery in Israel was death. Without this, whenever she approached someone else to marry, she would be unable to do so because the person would not know whether they would be subject to a charge of adultery. And so the law here says you must give, if you're going to push a woman away, according to the Jews, you must give her a bill of divorcement. The bill of divorcement is separate entirely from the act of pushing her away or divorcing her. Divorcing her is pushing her away. Giving the bill of divorcement is giving her a public document so that the first husband cannot bring a charge of adultery or cannot bring a charge of, of bigamy against the woman or the other man. Does that, does that make sense? And so what the Jews have done very cleverly, without really arguing it, is say, if the bill of divorcement can be given for any reason, then divorce can be given for any reason. These things don't follow at all. The, the fact that you could divorce a woman uh, for and, and what the reasons for that is, has nothing to do with whether if you divorce a woman, you have to give her a bill of divorcement. For example, suppose what the law said was, if you divorce a woman, you have to pay her a settlement. You have to pay her damages. Uh, whenever you divorce a woman, you have to pay her damages. Well, that would be true in all divorce cases. But it wouldn't tell you anything at all about when you could divorce. And so they've subtly changed the issue from their opening question to the point that they want to argue about, which is, we think bills of divorce can be given for any reason whatsoever. We think we have good legal arguments for that. In any other case, the bill of divorce wouldn't be effective. We've won that argument in society. The bill of divorce is unchallengeable. Therefore, divorce can be made for any reason. And that doesn't even begin to follow in any kind of kind of way. While we're on Deuteronomy 24, a notice that in uh, all modern translations, as in the, the Septuagint, uh, the Greek Bible that's quoted from in this, this passage, the text uh, does not uh, teach us that you, have, uh, you must give a bill of divorcement. I'll now read you this entire thing so we can understand what the Hebrew text actually says. It contains four conditionals. If a man, if a man, if a man, if a man, if a woman, if a woman, if a woman, uh, there's a long series of conditionals before we ever get to a command. This law is dealing with a very, very, very narrow subject. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, and he gives it to her, and he then sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband also dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce and gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, 
then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring the sin, do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. What's the command here? What is commanded? Only one thing is commanded. The command is that after a man has divorced a woman, given her a certificate of divorce, sent her away, and then if she remarries, and if she is again divorced in the same way, then that woman cannot return to her husband. That's what's commanded. That's what's commanded. What is that command? Just think about what this command is. Most basically it's saying you can't remarry the same person that you divorced. It's a little more complicated than that. There has to be a subsequent remarriage. Okay? This, this command has nothing to do, not the slightest bit to do, with a command saying, you may divorce. There is no authorization of divorce here. There is no permission of, of divorce here. Nothing. There is a, the only command in this passage is, you can't take back your wife if you've divorced her and she's remarried, then divorced again, and then wants to come back to you. That's what's commanded. Now you understand what's really misleading about a citation to this passage. What's quoted in this, in this law is indeed having something to do with divorce. But what it says is, it announces a limitation on the divorcing husband. If you divorce a woman and you give her a bill of divorcement, you can't take it back if she remarries. There, there's no possibility for, for resolving that. Indeed, the only divorce that we know really happens in this passage. The only, the only thing that Moses actually rules on and says, here is a true separation between man and woman, is not the first divorce and not the second divorce. It's the effect of the adultery in the second relationship. So think about this. Does Moses say that the first divorce works, that it occurs? Remember, there's no word divorce in the Hebrew. It just says he sends her away. It's a physical act. He sends her away. Then she marries, and then a second person. And the word marriage isn't the word marriage either. It just says takes. Someone takes. Again, it's a descriptive act. There's a taking. The first man takes, then he pushes away. The second man takes, then he pushes away. Was the first act of divorce legitimate? Moses doesn't say. Was the second act of divorce legitimate? Moses doesn't say. Moses comments on one issue. He judges one issue. Or we should say, the Lord, through Moses, judged on one issue. The only issue of divorce which is firmly stated here in our modern sense of the word is, if you have sent a woman away, and she has been taken by another man, and then she's been sent away again, you are well and truly divorced. You cannot take her back. It's impossible. That would be an abomination. Very strong language. This would bring a curse upon the land. So is there a teaching about divorce here? Yes, there is a teaching about divorce. And the teaching about divorce is what makes a divorce for sure is adultery. Now you say, well, where's the, the adultery? Well, you today might say, look, if the first husband divorces a woman and sends her away and she marries somebody else and, and sleeps with him, this is all good because there was a divorce. And so there's no adultery in the second relationship. But that's not what Moses says. Moses says that what happens in the second relationship defiles. It defiles. What defiles? Sin defiles. What defiles? Wrong defiles. Why is the woman defiled? She's defiled because the second relationship she's entering into is adulterous. Well, why do I think that? 
I think that because that's exactly when Jesus teaches on the upshot of this argument. This is how he concludes. This is at the end of, of Matthew. I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. What does that have to do with Deuteronomy 24? It has everything to do with Deuteronomy 24. That's what Deuteronomy 24 is describing. Is that a a divorce without more in no way terminates the marriage in such a way that the relationship of fidelity between man and woman, which God has laid down, no longer needs to be abided. No longer needs to be kept. The whole point of the passage is, even if a man gives a woman a bill of divorcement, even if he goes through all the formalities of divorce, there is something that cannot be eradicated by the act of man. And if after she has gone and been with another man, you want to resume the first marital relationship, you cannot do so. That would be an abomination. What would be wrong with that? Because an an act of unfaithful sexuality has come between the first husband and his and his wife and at that point Moses says and only then there is true separation between the man and woman in math in mark this is worked out a, a little bit longer there at the end when Jesus teaches after Jesus had argued with the Pharisees the disciples asked Jesus about this, and he, this is kind of like Jesus giving the restatement of the law. He says, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Well, what else is Deuteronomy 24 saying? What, what ruptures the relationship between man and woman is not the giving of the certificate of divorce. It's not even the sending away. If a man sends away a woman, can he take her back? Well, Moses says the only way he doesn't have to, he can't uh, take her back is if she's been taken by another man. Then he can't take her back. But before that, can he take her back? Absolutely, he can take her back. You follow? What I hope you you see here is there's a real legal argument going on. The the Pharisees are citing authorities, and Jesus is making a far better statement of the actual legal authority than the Pharisees are. This is why it said the Pharisees are testing Jesus. They are are testing him because they're, they're not engaged in a good faith, open discussion about what the law requires. They are they are presenting one issue and actually arguing for another. Now, how does does Jesus deal with with this kind of of test? Well, he deals with it in in the truest way that you can deal with anything. If you you understand the law and write correctly, what you always want to do when you're addressing an issue is trace it back to the first principle. When you you find an issue presented, you want to make sure you understand how that issue is framed in the overall law. If it's a a contract dispute, you want to make sure you consider the law of contracts. If it's a tort dispute, you want to consider the law of, of torts. You want to know if it's civil law or criminal law. You want to know if it's private law or public law. You want to know if it's constitutional law. You want to know how it it fits in. And indeed, this doesn't just stop at the various sources of, of human law. But we always want, we don't have to think through this every time, but we always want all of our legal thinking to be structured from God to man. We want to be like those angels with our eyes on justice and mercy. And how do we know justice and mercy? By knowing the justice and mercy of God. Jesus keeps his eyes fixed on God. He immediately replies. He immediately pulls the issue back and says, the, the, the way in which you're framing this issue as a verbal dispute about Deuteronomy 24 completely misunderstands what's going on in Deuteronomy 24. Marriage is what we're trying to understand. And the opposite of, of an honorable marriage, which is adultery, is what we're trying to understand here. You are, are looking at a passage on divorce without understanding where the law of divorce comes from, where it fits. 
Divorce is not a separate category of law. Divorce deals with a breakdown, a defect, a problem of, of sin and human heartedness in the law of marriage. And so Jesus immediately moves to the law of marriage. You get a better sense of the to and fro in, in Matthew 19. The Pharisees say, can you divorce a woman for each and every reason? And Jesus knows what they're talking about. There's a very famous ancient debate in the first century. He knows they're referring to Deuteronomy 24, and he knows how they want to settle this. Just in the text of Deuteronomy 24, and not even reading all that we read today, just reading that one sentence that deals with the certificate of divorce. And Jesus immediately draws their minds back to God. Haven't you read that at the beginning, the Creator, and in your jurisprudence and your overall understanding of law, this is where you need to begin too, with creation, with the way that the man is, is made by God, with the institutions that God has made and that God has legislated from the beginning. Haven't you read that at the beginning, the Creator made the male and female, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And so if God has said it, then the two are no longer two, but one. And therefore, what God has joined together let man not separate. So the Pharisees push forward their argument from Deuteronomy 24, and Jesus says, let's look at God here. I'm going to get back to Deuteronomy 24, but let's begin with understanding what this law is about. Divorce is not understood in itself. Divorce is understood in relationship to marriage. And marriage is a divine joining of man and woman so that they're no longer two, but one. And what you say when you say, push your wife away, what you're talking about is separating what God has joined together. Now, the Jews come back and say, well, why was there this command? Well, First off, it's not a command. Nobody is commanded to divorce. There's not the slightest hint in Deuteronomy 24 that people are commanded to divorce. There's no command. You see their shift. They have to say, ah, well, they were commanded to give a bill of divorcement for any and every reason. Right? That's what they're really arguing, is that you can read from when you have to give a bill of divorcement to when you can divorce, which doesn't make any sense. But Jesus has already exposed that. Jesus has already exposed that because he said, divorce is not where we begin. We begin with marriage. We begin with the act of God, and then we move to consider divorce. And so they say, well, why did he do this? And he gives the, the, good, the good answer there in Mark 10, 5. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. We're going to talk in just a little bit about hardness of heart and what Jesus means there. He's referring to another passage in Jeremiah there uh, that people often, often mistake and, and miss, but we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a second. But what he's contrasting here is very simple. It's the difference between what the law requires, what it means for something to be lawful in the sense of requiring it, authorizing it, uh, praising it, sanctioning it, creating a duty to do it, and what the law takes up for the purpose of providing remedies. What the law does in a remedial context. What's the remedial context? Well, he could be referring, making several arguments at the same time. One argument would be, look, the command about the bill of divorcement is for the protection of a woman. It is, it is to limit what the man can do. In the, the Jewish laws at the, at the time, you couldn't just write a bill of divorcement in your own hand. First off, most people couldn't write, so you'd have to go to a rabbi or a scribe and get them to write you a bill of divorcement. This would take time. 
It couldn't be done uh, frivolously or overnight. It created a procedural hurdle to doing this. And so you can read Jesus as saying, it's because he knew that you guys were such sinners that he had to put procedural obstacles in your, in your path. This is not an authorization. This is a procedural barrier. Uh, the, the other way of, of looking at it is it's because of your hardness of heart that it was permitted. What was permitted? What divorce is permitted? The, the only divorce that's recognized here is that the man cannot take back the woman after he's divorced her and she's been divorced again and wants to come back. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, uh, you should know that in many ancient societies and in some modern societies, uh, men have terrible, uh, awful abuse of, of marriage where they marry a woman, divorce her, marry her to someone else, and then take her back and then do it again. It's a form of, of pimping or pandering by which you divorce a woman, marry her to someone else, and then take her back. One thing that they could be doing here is God is saying, it is because of your absolute filthiness where you use sacred marriage, which was designed to bring a man and a woman together, you use that as a form of prostitution. You use it as a covering and a structure for prostitution. Or another thing it, it, could, it could mean here is, you have no fear of adultery. Adultery is called the great sin in Genesis 20. Uh, we'll talk about why in just a second as well. It's called the great sin. It brings death. It brings destruction. It, it brings infertility. It, it brings ruin. It's the great sin, and you have no fear of it. You, you have no sense that when you drive someone off into adultery with another man that you've done anything wrong. You have no sense of honoring of what God's acts have been in creation. You, you are so hard of heart that you have no sensitivity at all to the most basic witness that God has given to you, which is in marriage, which is a sign of Christ's relationship to the church, which is a sign of God's relationship to Israel. You have, you have no sense you're hard-hearted. This is a, a, a legal argument. It is, it is a legal argument that is manifesting a temptation. And the temptation is, will we keep our eyes on God and His actions? Will we keep our, our eyes on what He has created and done, on justice and mercy? Or will we be drawn off into, as a, I, I can tell you, I actually find reading the arguments of Hillel and Shammai on these issues very, very, very fascinating. They're very interesting legal arguments. I can see why people spend a lot of time on them. It's a very interesting thing. I encourage you to, uh, to read it. Uh, but it is a desecration. It, it, it shows no sense of what's really at issue in marriage and adultery. And I just want to conclude now by reminding you what really is at stake in marriage and adultery. Because Jesus overcomes the temptation to engage in verbal, legal argumentation because he wants to teach you. He wants to teach you how to argue, first off. But he also wants to teach us about marriage and divorce. In the uh, second half of what I've, I've given you for your, your readings, I've included uh, all of the biblical mentions of bill of divorcement outside of our texts in Mark 10 and Matthew 19. When uh, Jesus would have thought about issues of divorce, he would have thought of what his father had done in respect of divorce. His earthly father, of course, Matthew 1, 18. We read these remarkable lines. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was betrothed. She was pledged. So the full equivalent under a Jewish law, Mosaic law of a marriage. Even though the marriage hadn't been consummated yet, 
although uh, Joseph hadn't taken Mary into his house, they were fully married. His mother Mary was betrothed to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, in doing this, he was a just man. There is nothing wrong. In fact, it's a positive right that if your spouse has committed adultery, you can divorce. That's not unjust. Remember Christ's teaching. Anyone who divorces, except in the case of, of adultery, uh, in the, except of unfaithfulness, commits adultery. The, he's not indicting Joseph. He's not saying, how dare you uh, divorce think to divorce Mary. He, he says that was right. And the gospel writer tells us that was right. But he doesn't only think of his earthly father, Joseph. He thinks of his heavenly father. In the, the, the prophets, uh, we find regularly the relationship between Israel and God described as a marriage. Uh, some examples of that that I've included here where the bill of divorcement are, are discussed are after the marriage has been broken. Israel has gone and committed adultery, God says. Now, how has Israel uh, committed adultery? God says, you were like my bride when you followed me through the desert. I, I led you out of Egypt and you followed me so faithfully, just like a bride follows her husband. But then when I'd taken you home and I'd given you all these riches and I'd done all these things for you, then you began running around with other men. And if you read Ezekiel and Hosea, these images get very, very, very uh, vivid. Israel wh whored herself out. She sold herself as a prostitute. She was married to a good and faithful husband. And she was sleeping with everybody in sight. In what sense? Because she was running after other gods. And God divorced Israel. And when I say divorced Israel, here I mean the northern kingdom. But Judah, he did not divorce. In what sense? Israel was given a bill of divorcement, but Judah was not. And so he picks this up in, in Isaiah. This is what the Lord says. He's talking to the, the, the people in Babylon, and they're complaining about their, their fate. And he says, where is your mother's certificate of divorce? Meaning, I didn't just give them a certificate of divorce like some men do. They see another woman they want, and they divorce their wife. They give them a certificate of divorce for no reason, for any reason. You can't say that about me. He goes on to say, you were the one who ran out on me. You were the one who left. You were sent away for your transgressions. I didn't give you a bill of divorcement for a frivolous reason. And then again in, in Jeremiah 3.1, uh, God is, is comparing himself in very uh, clear terms to Deuteronomy 24. If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and marries another man, should he return to her again? This is exactly the case of Deuteronomy 24. Would not the land be completely defiled? But you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers. Would you now return to me, declares the Lord? So God is explaining the situation of Judah and Israel to them in terms of marriage, just as he's oftentimes comparing the relationship between God and his people to marriage. Just as Paul says, the relationship between Christ and the church is the same as the relationship of a husband to his wife. You have left me. And now you want to return? And then Jeremiah 3.8 completes the thought. I gave faithless Israel, this is the northern kingdom now that was taken away by the Assyrians and lost and scattered among the nations. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce. 
I declared, you're no longer my wife. Anyone else can have them. I gave you this certificate or bill of divorce, and I sent you away because of all her adulteries. And yet I saw that her unfaithful sister Judah, the southern kingdom, had no fear. And she also went out and committed adultery. Because Israel's immorality mattered so little to her, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stone and wood. In spite of all this, her unfaithful sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but only in pretense. The Lord said to me, faithless Israel is more righteous than unfaithful Judah. What we've read in Deuteronomy 24 is not only to be understood, uh, not only not to be wrestled over in a verbal way when God has clearly laid down the ordinances of marriage in creation. That's not the only error. But Jesus is also very deeply arguing with them about another point, which is you should understand the nature of the bill of divorcement and the act of, of divorce in relationship to what my Father in heaven has done, and also my Father on earth. He only ever divorced Israel because of its adulteries. The, the ground in our calling to imitate God has a clear predicate in marriage. God is, has divorced, and He's done it for one reason, and it was adultery. And just so you understand what the reference to hardness of, of heart is, uh, this continue, I haven't put this in your reading, but this continues on in, in Jeremiah chapter 4. God says, you know what? Even though a man can't take back an adulterous woman, I will take you back. Even though a man can't do it, I'm going to do something where I take you back. And that, of course, is done through Jesus Christ. The new marriage of man and God is in Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ. This is what he says. If you, but if you will return to me, O Israel, then return to me. Just put your idols out of my sight and no longer go astray. And if in a truthful, just, and righteous way you swear as surely as the Lord lives, then the nations will also be blessed by him, and in him they will glory. So this is what the Lord says to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed ground. He's talking about their hearts. Break up your unplowed ground. Don't sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hard hearts. Now in Hebrew... It's circumcise your hearts. But in the Greek translation that is quoted in the New Testament, in the Septuagint, the word there is circumcise the hardness of your hearts. What is Jesus referring to when, when he says that Moses wrote this because of the hardness of your hearts? God has been pleading with Israel in Jeremiah all you have to do is really repent, and you won't do it, because you are hard-hearted. God has given an example to Israel of the conditions of divorce. And God has said, if it were possible just for you to get rid of your hard-heartedness, then we could overcome this divorce between man and God. I would no longer keep you away, even though you have have been my wife, and you married me, and then you ran off in adultery, I would take you back if only you weren't hard-hearted. Jesus is, is pointing, there, I mean, there are only three passages in the Old Testament where this is discussed, this, this certificate of divorce outside Deuteronomy 24. And he's pointing them with an arrow to the culmination of the discussion of the one in Jeremiah uh, chapter 3. 
What keeps God and man apart in their marriage? Why can't Israel, the adulterous bride, return to her husband? Because of the hardness of their hearts. Why did Moses write this law? He wrote it to keep men from pimping out their wives. He wrote it because it's an abomination for people not to deal with adultery in the right way. But he also wrote it because it's a clear spiritual sign to you that the whole nature of divorce is not just a matter between men and women. It's a matter of the relationship between God and man. And your spiritual state, when you have committed adultery, when you have been gods and then you have gone and committed adultery with other gods, your spiritual state is the one described in Deuteronomy 24. You cannot be taken back. But the prophet says, even though it is so hard that you have betrayed me, even though I've been your good husband and you have betrayed me in the most contemptible ways, in huge numbers of adulteries, I will take you back. All that you must overcome is your hard-heartedness. The law was given for your spiritual unhard-heartedness, and the redemption that's being offered to you in Jesus Christ, you tempting Pharisees, is what you lack. A cure for your hard hearts. That's a great legal argument. Jesus is doing all of those things. The Pharisees think they're very tricky. They throw up different arguments. They're very clever. But Jesus not only refutes their arguments at the level at which they're offered, he not only educates us about the standards of human justice, he points us to the, the, the central issue of our relationship with God. That's what legal arguments should do. This is where we began the course. Legal uh, law is a preparatory. It is an introduction. Good law leads man back spiritually to God. It prepares the way for man to return to God. This argument is not merely good. This argument is crying out to you to be saved through true repentance through true understanding of what your good husband wants for his bride, the church. I'll just close by reminding you that this is the clear teaching of the New Testament as well. Paul says, be imitators of God and live a life of love, just like Jesus Christ loved and gave himself up for us. And then he applies this to marriage. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. And as the, Christ, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands. You see the parallels he's making? He's saying the structure of Jesus' relationship to the church, just like it was for, for Israel and God in the wilderness, so it is for man and woman in marriage. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing with water through the word and to present, herself, uh, to present her blameless as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does for the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And this is a profound mystery. Same line that Jesus quoted, but I am speaking of Christ and the church. Don't dispute about a divorce like, like it's a matter of words. Understand. Have understanding. Soften your heart. Receive what God has given to you. The relationship between a man and a woman in, in marriage, it is a symbol, it is a signifier, it is a, a, a call to man in his relationship with God. God announces himself in creation as a, a good husband and calls to us to be his bride. 
what we do in, in marriage, the, the laws we have in marriage and the practices we have in marriage are modeling our relationship to God. Soften your hearts and repent because we live in an adulterous generation, a generation of untold adulteries in the way that people conduct their marriages and divorces with no sense, no understanding of what adultery is, how it's a great sin, how it's a tragedy, how destructive it is, and more with no sense of our spiritual adultery to our spiritual husband. Jesus doesn't just argue against the Pharisees, though he does very well. He argues against us. He doesn't just call the, the Pharisees to see the error of their ways. He calls us. He doesn't just teach the Pharisees what the law of Moses is. He teaches the spiritual nature of the relationship of marriage to the relationship of man and God. A great, great legal argument. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, fix our eyes on you so that as we are tried and tempted by the words of the law, we may always move from a knowledge of you and your justice and your mercy and the laws that you have made for all mankind, even in the beginning of creation, to the truth of things, to honor you and grow close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.